Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this, your holy, inspired, and errant word. We thank you for preserving it for us, that we might have it this day to be read, that we might understand it. But we pray this morning for more than human understanding. We pray that you would open our eyes, open the eyes of our heart, that we might behold wondrous things from your law that you would teach us and train us, correct us, even rebuke us for righteousness' sake, that we might be made whole. Oh, Father, bless the preaching of your word unto the hearts of your people. And Father, would you help me, your servant, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you, O God. You are my rock and my redeemer. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Britain's Derek... Redmond had dreamed all his life of winning a gold medal, a gold medal in the 400 meter race. And his dream was in sight as the gun sounded in the semifinals at the Barcelona Olympics in 1992. He got off to a great start and he was running the race of his life. As he rounded the turn into the backstretch, he heard in his ears a pop and he felt a sudden sharp pain go up the back of his leg. He fell face first onto the track with a torn right hamstring. But Derek got up. Defying logic, he got up and he began struggling to finish the race. And as he hobbled along in pain, uh, there, there came a man from the stands running to embrace him. And if you've seen this video, this man takes out a security guard on his way there. And he comes running to embrace him. And that man was Jim Redman. It was Derek's father. And he looked at his son and he said, you don't have to do this. The son, through tears, looked at him and said, yes, I do. And dad said, well, then we're going to finish this race together. We're going to finish it together. And they did. The whole world watched in awe as Derek finished the race, oftentimes his head buried in his father's chest and his dad serving as a crutch for him to make sure he crossed that finish line on his feet. He didn't win the gold that day. He didn't win the gold. But he walked away with an incredible memory of a father who never hesitated to come to him in his pain, a father who ran to him to help him finish the race. I alluded to it earlier, but many of us feel a little bit like Derek Redmond these days, don't we? We feel stagnated. We might even feel sidelined by all that is happening to us and all that's happening in the world around us. We're running our races fairly well, at least we thought we were running our races fairly well, but then out of nowhere, we were thrown to the ground by a stinging injury, a global pandemic, a divided community, a bitter election season, the loss of employment, the death of a loved one, the loneliness of isolation, many, many, many plans disrupted or insert any of the other myriad of hardships that we've faced during this wearying and difficult year. 
Whatever we've faced or are facing even now, many of us feel as though we're just short of the finish line. We're wondering if we're even going to make it to the finish line. And perhaps we're even wondering when someone is going to jump out of the stands and run to us and carry us along as we struggle to finish the race. The season of Advent comes at just the right time, does it not? The season of Advent comes at just the right time. For what better reminder can we receive than the reminder that we do indeed have such a person? We do indeed have a wonderful father who called his son to leave the glories of heaven and not only come to our side to carry us along as we run the race before us, but you know what else? He actually put on our shoes and he ran the race for us so that his victory would one day be our victory as well. You see, Advent reminds us that although we may be weary, there is still much reason to rejoice. There is still much reason to rejoice. And we get our first glimpse of this joy in our text this morning as we encounter the thrill of hope that filled Elizabeth and her baby John. The thrill of hope that filled them when the expectant mother Mary arrived at their home for a visit. It's a familiar story to many of you. It's familiar to most of us, right? But it's nevertheless a story, a true story, that we need to be reminded of again and again and again, especially today, especially now. So let's take a look at what's unfolds before us. And as we do it, we're going to do it in two parts. I know many of you like to take notes, so here's your two-point outline this morning. First, Elizabeth's story, and second, Elizabeth's song. Her story and her song. It's fair to say that most of us have certainly had a hard year. I think it's fair to say that Elizabeth had a hard life. Elizabeth had a hard life, and we get the first glimpse of her story, the, the story of her hard life back earlier in chapter one, verses five through seven. Would you look there with me? Luke chapter one, beginning in verse five. We're told that in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statues of the Lord. But, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. See, Elizabeth is a godly woman. What does the text say? It says that she walked blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. The text here leaves no doubt that she was a devout woman. She was among the daughters of Aaron's line, and she was married to a priest named Zechariah. The picture that's painted for us here in this text leaves us with the impression that devotion to the Lord and his word was the very breath that she exhaled. She was a godly woman. Verse 7, though, shows us a glimpse that we don't always get. We get a glimpse of her inward condition. There, we're told that she is barren. She is unable to conceive. On top of this, the text says that her and Zechariah were advanced in years. What does that mean? They were old. We should probably adopt that language, shouldn't we? I'm not old, I'm advanced in years. It's kinder language. And what they're telling us is that, earthly speaking, there wasn't any hope of her conceiving a child. And don't forget the time in which she lives. She lives in a time and in a society where a woman's worth was often measured in proportion to the number of children that she had and the success of those children, particularly if they were boys. Elizabeth 
earthly account of such worth was empty. Surely, though, we're told that she knows the word. Do you think as she read God's word and heard God's word, do you think that perhaps she found hope in the women of the past? Women like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, Samson's mom? You think maybe as she heard these stories of these women who were all at one time barren but eventually graced by the Lord with children, Sarah, even when she was advanced in years, even when she was old, surely this gave her some hope. But it's just as likely that the doldrums of her days served as a stinging reminder of this one adjective that was used to describe her everywhere she went and in everything that she did. Barren. Elizabeth was barren. To a watching world, she was Elizabeth, the barren one. Oh, there goes Elizabeth, the barren one. There goes Elizabeth, the one without children. So it must have come as a shock It must have come as a shock when her now mute husband came home attempting to tell her of what had happened to him in the temple. When the angel Gabriel told him when he was there serving in the temple. Do you remember? We'll go back in your scriptures to verse 11. We're told in 8, 9, and 10 that it was his turn to go into the temple to burn the incense. And he goes in and does it. Look at verse 11. And there appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Wow. Let's not stop there, though. Let's keep going. And Zechariah said to the angel, how am I going to know this is going to happen? All right, what does he say? How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Smart guy. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. And they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them. And he remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. He went to his home. Apparently, the news that he heard was truly unbelievable. He didn't believe it. At first, Zechariah was told that his prayers were heard. His prayers had been heard and he would bear a son, but not just any son, a great prophet, a great prophet who would go forth in the spirit and the power of Elijah to prepare the way for the Lord. I'm sure that these words sounded familiar to him. I'm sure that they rang a familiar tune in his ears. For what was the last word that God had given to his people through a prophet? Do you know? Malachi. You can turn there if you want. You just go back a couple of books right at the end of the Old Testament. Some 400 years before Malachi chapter four, verses five through six, this is what it says, and I quote, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet 
before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Do you hear the tune? What? Can you imagine being Zechariah at this point? We'll hear his song later, right, when he actually gets to speak, but can you imagine? Your wife, who's advanced in years, is going to bear a son, and he's going to be that prophet. He will be the one. So this man of God, who knows the word of God, recognizes this, and he's stunned. And so he asks, how can I know? It's a pretty common question, isn't it? Give me a sign. How can I know? I'm old. My wife is old. Shocking news. And so because of his unbelief, he's made mute. He's made mute. And so he returns home mute. He's unable to speak. That's probably not the sign he was asking for, right? But it's the sign he got. I can just imagine the scene with him coming home. He's, he's trying to sign to everyone else outside the temple, right? And now he goes home. Could you imagine how he's trying to tell Elizabeth this? We don't have any details in the text, but can you just picture it in your head? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, can you just picture it? Sorry for those of you listening on audio. You can't see what I just did. <laughs> but can you picture it? Can you even imagine What does it tell us in verse 24? After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. After these days, she conceived. After all those years, she's finally conceived. What does she say in verse 25? Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. You don't think it was tough to be barren? It's tough to be barren even now. It's a reproach for some. But God has done great things for her. All those hard and difficult and painful years, all of those years are now repainted in the vibrant hues of God's immeasurable mercy. You see Elizabeth, who had been unable to conceive all those years, Her barrenness had a purpose. She sees now the purpose. And what was it? It was the purpose to bring glory to God. For God had finally, now he had looked upon her from heaven. He had came to her side by his grace. And he had granted that she would conceive Zechariah's child. The one who would prepare the way for the Lord. Prepare the way for the Messiah. How do you think she would react? Again, you know the story. And I do this a lot. Take yourself out of what you know. What's the next thing you expect to see happen, right? What do you expect? You would think she's going to run through the streets, right? In exultant joy. She's going to call upon everyone she knows and send message that I have conceived a child. What does it say that she does? She kept herself hidden for five months. Reminds me of when the shepherds appeared to Mary to see the baby Jesus. And it says that Mary hid these things in her heart. Elizabeth kept herself hidden for five months. It's hard to know exactly why she did this, but we do know that it's not the end of her story. We do know that her story's not done because there's another surprise waiting for her. There's another surprise waiting for her right outside her front door. And that brings us to our second point this morning, Elizabeth's song. In verses 26 through 38, Luke records how in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel made a visit again, but this time it was to her young relative. He visited her young relative, Mary, telling her that she would supernaturally conceive a child, a child who would be the promised Messiah, the Son of God. And in verses 36 to 37, you can look there. Gabriel tells Mary, and behold, your relative, Elizabeth, likely a cousin, but it's her relative, 
your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Hearing this, Mary arose. She hears this, she rises, and verse 39 says, she went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. Mary wastes no time. The impression that we are meant to be left with here is that she went right away, perhaps even the very same day. She got up and went. And the journey she went on, if you've done any study on this, you know it wasn't an easy one. She likely traveled almost 100 miles over some really rough terrain. It would have taken her probably three to five days to make this journey to go see her relative. So imagine the surprise when Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting. She's already filled with hope at her own blessing from the Lord. Notice how verse 41 describes what happens next. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Now, this is important detail. And not only does this detail verify for us the sanctity of life within the womb, it does do that, but it also harkens back to Malachi chapter four. It also goes back to there as well. We're told in verse two of Malachi four that when the day of the Lord comes, when the son of man comes, when the Messiah comes, you will go out leaping like calves from the stall. It's kind of unassuming, doesn't it? You'll go out leaping. Well, the word for leaping in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, is the same word that's used here. It's the same word. John leaps with joy, like a calf out of the stall. Now, I haven't spent a lot of time around cattle. Maybe you have. But thanks to YouTube, you can see videos of what this looks like. It's fun to watch. I get a big smile on my face when I see these come through, right? It's like these young calves, they've, they've been born essentially in captivity, right? They've been born in the stall. They've been kept there until spring. And when spring hits and they go outside, it's like grass, right? And they start leaping and bounding with joy. And even a grown man like me finds a lot of joy in watching those videos. In fact, I went back and looked at some just for this because that's the picture we're to get, The baby in Elizabeth's womb hears Mary and he leaps with joy. He leaps with joy, just as young calves do when they're released. Don't miss this. John is still yet a baby in his mother's womb. He recognizes the presence of Jesus, a very new baby a very new baby in his mother Mary's womb. And John's response is to leap with joy. And notice that when he leaps, so does the soul of Elizabeth. (laughs) When he leaps, I mean, come on, she's this far along in her pregnancy. She'd surely felt him move before, but not like this. (laughs) So filled with the Holy Spirit, and this is important. It's important to see that she's filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Right? Paul reminds us that no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and she belts out a song of praise. And it is a song. It's poetic, like the others that we'll encounter. You see, when John jumped, Elizabeth shouted. He jumped and she shouted, gripped by a thrill of hope. She rejoices with a loud cry and she says, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed is the baby that is in your womb even now. And why, she asks, is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What a work of the spirit. You ever wonder, how does Elizabeth know that Mary is pregnant? How does she know? The Holy Spirit, right? (laughs) The Holy Spirit. 
how does she know that this child that Mary is carrying is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world? How does she know that? Only by the Holy Spirit. That's the only answer I can come up with. It was revealed to her by the Spirit. That's not the only thing the Spirit does for her. I want you to notice what else the Spirit of God does for Elizabeth. Look how humble she is in her song. Don't miss her humility. You see, for six months now, the big excitement in her life had been her own pregnancy. Right? But rather than thinking of her own good news, what does she do? She immediately praised God for what God had done for Mary. She wasn't jealous. I have to share this now with someone else. No. She honored Mary as the mother of the Lord, the most blessed woman in the world. That's the language she uses. Like the angel Gabriel, she says that Mary is favored by God's grace. Let me just say this now. This does not mean that Elizabeth is worshiping Mary. Elizabeth is not worshiping Mary, even as some would want to do today. No, we worship God and God alone. Rather, she's blessing her. The one who has been blessed is now blessing Mary. She's blessing her faith, rejoicing in the fact that what she had believed would have been spoken to her. You wonder where Zechariah is right now, right? Do you wonder that? Like, did he hear this? Because <laughs> he heard and he didn't really believe. And so he was made mute. And here's one who hears and acts right away. He then gets up to go see her cousin. Even with all that, the most important thing that Elizabeth said was not even about Mary. The most important words that came from her mouth were not even about Mary. The most important thing that she said was about Jesus. The most important thing she said was about Jesus. Going even further than calling him Lord, how does she address him? My Lord. My Lord. Don't miss that. That's a remarkable thing for her to say. And you know what? In doing so, Elizabeth becomes the first recorded person to confess her faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. Don't miss that. She confesses her faith in Jesus as Lord. She becomes the example of how each and every person is to respond to the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ by trusting in him as Savior and rejoicing in him as their, your, my Lord. Couldn't help but get an old hymn out of my head. This is her story. This is her song, praising her Savior all the day long. Do you see? Do you see how in this story and song of Elizabeth, do you see how God meets his people in their weariness? Do you see how God runs to Elizabeth's help in ways that are more than she could ever hope, dream, or imagine? Do you see how her experience of the appearing of Jesus right there in her midst, even if he was only a, a tiny baby yet lodged in the womb of his mother? Do you see how her experience of his appearing caused something to happen? She joyfully confessed that he is her Lord. Brothers and sisters, this is why we take time each and every year to celebrate the season of Advent. In our weariness, we need to be reminded that God has not left us without hope. God has not abandoned us. By calling his son to leave the glories of heaven and to live and die for us, he has met the greatest need of each and every one of our souls. He's met our greatest need. When he sent Jesus in the likeness of flesh, God condemns sin in the flesh, thus paving the way for us to truly finish the race, to cross the finish line of eternal life. Listen, Advent reminds us 
Elizabeth's story and song reminds us that though we may be weary, we still have much reason to rejoice. Do you believe that? You still have much reason to rejoice. So rejoice. I mean, let out a hoop and holler if you want. You can rejoice. Our calling this morning is clear. To rejoice, to leap with joy. Rejoice that God has met us in our time of need. Rejoice that because Jesus came to us, we can most certainly come to him. And so that's what we do. We come to Jesus. Those beautiful lyrics of the song that Jess and the team sang for us earlier. Did you, did you listen? Come, all you unfaithful. Come, weak and unstable. Come and know that you're not alone. Come, barren and waiting ones, weary of praying. Come, see what your God has done. Come, bitter and broken. Come with fears that are unspoken. Come and taste of his perfect love. Come, guilty and hiding ones. There's no need to run. See what your God has done. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. He's the lamb who was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace for those who believe. So come. Though you have nothing, come. He is the offering. Come and see what your God has done. Rejoice. Rejoice, Christ has come. Amen and amen.